Hi, I'm Wade Laszlo, and this is another edition of Correction News and Views. There's a lot of things I'd like to discuss today. We'll get going with Garrity and Tennyson. If you ever go to Internal Affairs, you can sign the Garrity and Tennyson warning. What this does is this protects your rights. The Garrity warning, you waive your Fifth Amendment rights to not incriminate yourself in return. They can only use it for internal discipline. And the Tennyson warning has to do with what can become public and private. There's a couple of items that are in the news that have to do with uh, Garrity and Tennyson. The first one is from uh, Laverno and Arnett uh, LPA out of Columbus, Ohio. It has to do with a Garrity violation. Um, this is going to sound very similar to somebody who currently works for our department. In State versus Jackson, the employee, a police officer, was questioned about his involvement in a bar fight. And during the questioning, of course, he was questioned under Garrity, and those Garrity statements were turned over to a prosecutor. It says the prosecutor's use of the statement during trial preparation not only violated Jackson's constitutional rights, but also revealed that the police department broke its promise to Jackson that neither the statement nor the fruits of the statement would be used in later criminal proceedings. When such a promise has been made to a public employee, the public employer should not provide the prosecutor with compelled statement. When the state is free to review a Garrity statement, the public employer cannot ensure that the statement will not be used directly or derivatively. The public employer may run a risk of a lawsuit if it turns over a Garrity statement to prosecutors. In other words, a public employer or a public official who compel an employee's testimony but then violate Garrity by turning the statement over to the police or use the statement in criminal proceedings could be held personally liable for violating the employee's constitutional rights. A little bit closer to home in Minneapolis. The Minneapolis police officer's Tennyson rights were violated and it cost the city $75,000. This is from the Star and Tribune, dated April 16, 2010. A Minneapolis police lieutenant since demoted to sergeant and his attorney will share a $75,000 settlement of his lawsuit that claimed the city defamed him and improperly disclosed news of his suspension. The city council voted 11 to nothing. The deal Friday was after a closed meeting with city attorneys. So you can see that Garrity and Tennyson are very powerful protections for us, and they carry very, very powerful penalties if the employer violates those things. The next thing I'd like to discuss is a letter that we received from uh, Teamsters Local 320, Sue Morin, dated March 24th, 2010. In it, she discusses that they're making their first steps to uh, licensure of uh, correctional officers, detention deputies, correctional officers, much like the police are licensed in the state of Minnesota. While I have great respect for Sue Marin and Teamsters Local 320 and all that they've done with us, I'm going to beg to differ with them on this one. I think our legislative priority should be the Corrections Officers Bill of Rights. In 2002, our business agent Tom Perkins introduced the bill in the Minnesota Senate. Since then, it's pretty much languished and I think the time has come for its passage. Um, the language is similar to the Peace Officers Bill of Rights, but it applies to our profession. I think that we know, need those protections. And also, too, I think that it's time that we quit going it alone. The largest corrections group in the state of Minnesota is AFSCME. The, they make up 70% of the corrections officers in Minnesota, including the state corrections officers. It happened at the Step 2 grievance meeting about our 2080 hour hours worked in excess of the 2080 hours. And the response since that meeting came on April 14th, 2010, the Sheriff's Office denied the Step 2 grievance for hours worked in excess of 2010 hours. Um, the main crux of it is, is the county wants to go by payroll year and it says the crux of the disagreement between the parties is that the union believes that the calendar year from January 1st, 2009 to December 31st, 2009 is the period of time that must be used to determine whether the employee worked more than an average 80 hours per payroll period or 2,080 hours per year. They disagree. So I've uh, moved it on to the next level. We'll be presenting it to the Teamsters board to move it on to arbitration. Um, interesting enough, during that time, they sent me three sets of numbers. Um, figured out from January 1st to uh, December 31st, they owe me six hours. The way they figured it the first way, they owed me 41 hours, and they reconnoitered those figures, and lo and behold, I then owe them 
seven hours. So I guess it's going to be up to an arbitrator to straighten out this mess, but I do believe the contract is on our side on this one. And also this week, I also received another letter. This letter says, as you know, I was a member of the Fraternal Order of Police Lodge 27 in Denver for 15 years. During that time, I saw the Denver Sheriff's Department go through several changes. As good as Lodge 27 treated us, one thing we never could pull off was a vote of no confidence against the sheriff. It also, it always seemed when push came to shove, the members would become afraid of retaliation or who knows what. I want to applaud your efforts in holding your local 320 together to gather strength in numbers, my friends. In honor of spring, I would like to leave you with this beaver shot. Again, this is Corrections News and Views.